Is Congress actually trying to pass something that's going to help California gun owners? Perhaps here we see the Freedom from Unfair Gun Taxes Act. Let's talk about it. Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel today. That is right, last week we saw the inception in Congress of the Freedom from Unfair Gun Taxes Act, uh, both from a senator from Idaho as well as uh, an assemblyman from uh, California, uh, introduced this into Congress. We have brought back Matt Cabero. He is the author of the California Gun Laws books. He's keeping an eye on the, the AB 28 tax that's been implemented here in California, along with the lawsuit we have uh, on that tax here in California to talk about it. Matt, thank you very much for coming back with us. Thank you again for having me. Absolutely. So uh, if we can just jump right into this, uh, can you go ahead and just bring us up to speed uh, on the implementation as of uh, what was it, July 1st of the AB 28 tax, as well as the lawsuit that, that we filed against it? Sure. So obviously the tax took effect here on July 1st, and I believe we sent out press releases previously on it that uh, part of the fact that we we had to wait until the tax was actually implemented in order to file the lawsuit, because there's pretty clear uh, jurisprudence on the issue of challenging a tax in court in order to really challenge the tax, you actually have to pay the tax. You have to be injured by it. And so that's part of the reason why we had to wait until after the tax was implemented in order to file the lawsuit. Uh, but so what's happening next is that uh, we, we've already filed the lawsuit. Uh, there are a number of individuals that are named as plaintiffs because those individuals themselves has a, have of course paid the tax now they've purchased firearms after July July 1st after it was implemented but now it's sort of the next step with the dealers and so the dealers will be paying the tax typically on a quarterly basis and so i believe it's going to happen uh here in September that they will be having to transfer effectively the money that they've collected for the tax uh to the state of California and once that happens that's when we'll be adding uh, the individual dealers that are also going to be added to the lawsuit. And so that's why you haven't seen the dealers. Ha have, they haven't been added yet because they actually haven't paid the tax yet. And so we'll be amending the complaint uh, once that happens. And then once that happens, likely seeking what's called a motion for preliminary injunction to at least put a, a stop to the tax while the lawsuit is pending. At least that would be the hope. So that that's actually kind of interesting. Can 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 you help me bring, bring clarity to this uh, for me just for a second? The, the tax was imposed on July 1st, which means starting July 1st is when people needed to start paying this tax. Uh, but that's the consumer. Uh, the, the people who are actually paying the tax to the government is the FFLs or the people taking the money in, and that won't actually be paid for an entire quarter of a year. Is that right? Correct. And so basically, obviously, if you could walk into a gun store today and were to try and buy a gun, you have to pay the money for the tax to the dealer that's actually processing the transaction. But then the dealer doesn't process that tax collection every single time uh, that a transaction takes place. What they'll do is they'll do it on a quarterly basis, much like you pay your income tax on an annual basis. It's that kind of thing. So it's that's effectively what dealers do here in California is that they transfer the taxes that they've collected for the quarter uh, to the, I believe it's the CDTFA. Uh, California Department of Franchise Tax Administration, or I can't remember the, the exact uh, acronym for it. But basically, that is the agency that collects the tax uh, on behalf of dealers here in the state. And that that's effectively where that money ultimately goes to. So yes, it's the dealers pay it on the quarterly basis. But obviously, if you're an individual, you're paying it every time you purchase a firearm. Right. So, um, and, and, you know, I'm sure there's a whole bunch of reporting that goes along with it. Well, uh, here is, I guess, a proposed solution uh, from Congress. Like I already stated, it's the Freedom from Unfair Gun Taxes Act. Jacob, if you could actually pull this up, uh, a quote from uh, Assemblyman Issa, you've got four years extreme state policies and governors, including from my home state, He's referring to California there, uh, have targeted the fundamental Second Amendment rights of our fellow Americans. California's new imposition of a sin tax on firearms and ammunition equate a core constitutional freedom with gambling and drug use. Enough is enough. That's why Senator Reich and I are joining forces to introduce this key legislation and stop any state tax that seeks to raise the price of self-defense out of reach for any American. 
So I, I can't say that uh, we've made it uh, a habit to look to the federal government uh, for fixes here as far as California state laws are concerned. I guess what has kind of been made a habit is some of these anti-Second Amendment states uh, really looking toward California to import California legislation into those states. We have seen plenty of that here. Uh, you have several states, uh, you know, California, uh, Illinois, just to name a couple, uh, uh, New Jersey, I think also, who have already attempted to implement a similar tax to this. I guess my question is the way that this looks, um, is this is this an effort uh, in Congress to uh, you know subdue the California legislation in California uh, or really to prevent the spread of California to other states? And so obviously California is the first state to really impose its own excise tax. And so uh, representatives Isa and uh, uh, Rish have proposed this legislation at the federal level to not only, uh, basically make it unlawful for California to impose the tax as it, as it now it is, but also basically as a way of preempting other states from uh, ultimately adopting uh, similar measures. And so we actually do see this every once in a while. But, you know, keep in mind, the, the, cost, the Second Amendment to the Constitution is effectively it's what we're doing is the same thing here, where you have the Second Amendment as, uh, you know, the uh, uh, that prevents uh, states from enforcing unconstitutional laws so too would a federal statute preempts states from enforcing laws that are within the power of the federal government. And so by way of example, uh, many people are probably familiar with the Firearm Ownership Protection Act, and that prevents uh, states and individuals from suing uh, licensed manufacturers and dealers uh, for the criminal misuse of firearms in, in all 50 states. And so there, there are times where federal legislation like this uh, will most certainly prevent states like California from enacting a law like this and enforcing it, as well as preventing other states from doing the same. But how does it, how does it work uh, just on the fact that one is at the federal level and one is at the state level? I guess I can think of a couple of examples. Um, uh, one would be, especially for, or specifically in California, uh, federally, marijuana has been legal to uh, to purchase and use. But uh, a as far as the state is concerned, uh, it's legal. And actually, just what you mentioned, how uh, you know on the federal level, it's illegal to uh, sue firearms manufacturers. We just saw legislation passed that damages could be sought uh, from firearms manufacturers for. Um, you know, relation to firearms crimes in California. How would that shake out with something like this if you've got it at the federal level, but you have state laws that kind of undercut that? So I think like with the marijuana issue, it comes down to a question of enforcement, right? And we still have laws on the federal level that basically say marijuana in all forms is illegal. Uh, and so, but what you have is you have the current administration basically saying, we're not going to enforce that. And so states like California and a, and, a, and a handful of others have enacted their own laws that basically make it uh, lawful in those states to engage in those activities without fear of federal prosecution for obvious reasons, because the federal government has said we're not going to enforce that statute. And so in, in, in the opposite context, if you have the, you know, the federal government, like let's say the ATF, enforcing federal laws regarding firearm transfers, if you have a state law that directly conflicts with a federal statute regarding the, for example, record keeping requirements of FFLs, uh, machine guns, you know, that kind of thing, you, you've already seen uh, the federal government step in in cases where you have a state that, for example, says, well, we're just not going to enforce the federal laws in our state kind of thing. And that's an example of where the federal government will enforce uh, those laws. And so that would be the, I think, the distinction here between, for example, marijuana and firearms is that you most likely have at least some indication or, or you know, the enactment of this law that this is something that uh, should it pass at the federal level, that it would be enforced or at least could be enforced through the courts. Uh, but versus, you know, the marijuana statutes, like I said, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of effort on the federal government right now to enforce those federal statutes. Well, I guess uh, if, if we were to, you know, capture your final thoughts optimistically looking forward, let's just say, uh, you know, this this act gets passed by Congress. Uh, where exactly does that leave us? Does that leave us for an immediate impact uh, here in California as far as uh, the enforcement of AB 28 is concerned? And also, what would that do to our lawsuit as it's now actively moving through the court? Yeah, so let's assume it climbs that mountain, so to speak, where this were to actually get passed and, and signed uh, by the president. 
Uh, the current president, I would have doubts on him signing it, but you know, let's 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 hope for the best there. Or you know, potentially the ne the next administration. Maybe we have a new president here. You know, towards the uh, following the next election, they would be willing to sign it. And so, if that does happen, then yeah, potentially once that law takes effect, uh, the moment it takes effect, it could it, it is arguably preempting the state laws uh, regarding the same. And so. In, in the case of California, if the law is quite clear at the federal level that states cannot enact a tax like this, like California has done, then that immediately becomes uh, a, a conflict with federal law. And so whether or not California would then take steps, for example, to immediately cease enforcement and repeal uh, its law, that would remain to be seen. And you might have to see some, some federal court challenges along those lines should California refuse to do that. Uh, but that's effectively where that would go in that in that instance. Well, something certainly to look forward to. And yeah, I think that's a great point about uh, the, the potential changing of the guard uh, in the White House as far as getting the president to sign a piece of legislation like that. Matt, I want to thank you for coming on and sharing your thoughts and knowledge on this. I appreciate the time. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And guys, if you like videos like this, you want to stay up to date with the litigation and the legislation on, on, uh, on firearms that's going through the court system, please be sure to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Hit that little notification bell so as these videos come out, they go directly to you uh, so that you can view them. Thanks again, guys, and we'll see you on the next one.